Hello ladies and these and gentlemen. This video is about intersectionality and why I subscribe to it. Please note I am not claiming any academic expertise in this area, rather I am simply explaining why intersectionality plays a crucial role in my approach to politics. So what is intersectionality? I suppose we could ask these geniuses, who between them seem to define intersectionality as anti-cis, anti-white, anti-male, and for the harassment of privileged people. But, call me a snob, I'm a bit more fond of Professor Lickie's definition. A theoretical and methodological tool to analyse how historically specific kinds of power differentials and or constraining normativities based on discursively, institutionally, and or structurally constructed socio-cultural categorizations such as gender, ethnicity, race, class, sexuality, age, generation, disability, nationality, mother tongue, and so on, interact, and in so doing, produce different kinds of societal inequalities and unjust social relations. The notion of looking at how different socio-cultural categorizations intersect with one another has existed for a long time, but it was first given academic formality as intersectionality theory by Professor Kimberley Crenshaw in the 80s. Before anyone starts saying this, theory, note the keyword theory, while providing absolutely no evidence that it is true, which is why it is called intersectionality theory. The word theory when used academically refers to a comprehensive explanation of a subject, not guesswork or an unsubstantiated idea. Intersectionality is no more just a theory than evolution is just a theory, or music is just a theory, or property is just a theory, or linguistics is just a theory, etc. etc. Story time. This is Tim. He's black, male, cisgender, gay, working class, able-bodied, and suffers from occasional bouts of depression. As a black person, Tim is keen to get involved in advocating for racial equality, and as such makes an effort to attend a local group devoted to just that. While Tim is very encouraged to see so many people coming together to support a good cause, he is disheartened when he realises there are certain members of the group using homophobic language often openly, without challenge from others in the group. As a gay man, Tim is also keen to get involved in LGBTQ rights advocacy, and therefore he attends an LGBTQ group as well. At the LGBTQ group, Tim finds that the discussion is often dominated by people who are white and middle class. When discussing various incidents of homophobia and transphobia that people experience in their everyday lives, Tim mentions that people at his racial equality group often use homophobic slurs. He explains that as a black person, he feels he should feel safe and secure when attending a group devoted to racial equality, and that having to put up with homophobia is a serious obstacle to that. He goes on to explain how he feels that a group that seeks to empower black people should work to empower all black people, not just straight black people. Tim is interrupted by a white individual who tells him that this isn't really the place to discuss racism and that he is to stick to the topic at hand, homophobia. Tim, understandably offended, points out that he is discussing homophobia, specifically how he, as a black gay man, experiences homophobia. Both groups in this scenario have failed Tim because they fail to appreciate how his being gay and his being black are socio-cultural categorizations that unavoidably intersect with one another. Tim cannot stop being black when he walks into an LGBTQ advocacy group, nor can he stop being gay when he walks into a black civil rights group. The other members of these groups, however, can stop being racist and homophobic when they walk into these groups. Otherwise, Tim is put in the position of only being able to advocate for racial equality if he is willing to put up with homophobia, and only being able to advocate for LGBTQ rights if he is willing to put up with racism. I also mentioned that Tim is working class. Most of the people at his racial equality group are also working class, and as such understand how class intersects with race, unconsciously from their own personal experience. The LGBTQ group, however, is much more mixed when it comes to class. The white middle class members of the group, as well as dominating discussions, often are unsympathetic to the fact Tim is unable to attend all meetings, even going so far as to question his commitment to LGBTQ rights. If I can attend all meetings on time, then I don't see why you can't, says a white middle class person. 
Tim points out that he works two quite low-paying jobs just to stay afloat, and that he doesn't have the same amount of free time or disposable income as someone working one white-collar job. Needless to say, these experiences serve to exacerbate Tim's depression. To me, models like this make it pretty easy to understand the necessity for taking an intersectional approach to social justice issues and for applying intersectional social justice to political issues in general. Of course, not everyone sees the importance of intersectionality or even grasps the concept at all. In fact, it seems really weird that feminists are even concerning themselves with a racist issue at all, considering they're supposed to be all about women's rights. Feminists have to concern themselves with the issue of racism because gender and race are not mutually exclusive categorizations. Women and people of colour are not two distinct categories. Some women are people of colour, in case you hadn't noticed. If feminism is to be for the rights, opportunities and social status of women as an overall group, then it fails if it allows itself to be dominated by the voices and perspectives of white women. Said white women may often be very well intentioned, but if they fail to realise that they are excluding women of colour, then they need to learn about race as an issue, not just shrug their shoulders and say, that's not my area, I deal with sexism. Uh, don't, you, you claimed in that comment you left to me that people uh, disregarding the dead naming is transphobia or disregarding trans issues is transphobia. No, it's not. Here, let's put it this way. Let's say I'm an activist for something else. I'll say I'm an activist for the environment, and I don't actively become involved in transgender rights issues because I just don't feel like I have a place in it. For instance, I don't really have a place in deciding all of that because of who I am. So I don't do anything about that. I'm working on some other avenue or some other area of rights or preservation or something like that. That doesn't make you a transphobe, you fucking idiot. It just means that you're concentrating on other areas because you're not comfortable with being in one of those other areas. You can argue semantics as to the meaning of transphobia till the cows come home, but there's no denying that if an environmentalist group doesn't concern itself with being trans-inclusive, then that is problematic in that it hinders trans people who care about the environment from pursuing their ambition and in that it means there are less hands at work campaigning for environmentalism. The whole point of social justice is to remove barriers of disenfranchisement in all areas of society, not all areas except environmentalism. Being an environmentalist does not exempt someone from being called out on their cis privilege. Well. What you are referring to there is in fact a small branch of feminism called intersectional feminism, which is basically a bunch of feminists trying to stick their fingers into everyone else's pie, which bears great resemblance to social justice in that it works entirely on a system of privilege and oppression. You then also get all the other different types of feminism, the radical feminism. Which Firstly, we should note that Teal Deer seems to believe intersectional feminism and radical feminism are mutually exclusive. They aren't. Contrary to popular misconception, the radical in radical feminism refers to radical reform, not to hateful extremism. That's not to say radical feminists can't be hateful extremists, but that is not the defining quality that makes them radical. As such, it is perfectly possible for a person to apply an intersectional approach when advocating for radical reform. Secondly, we should note that Teal Deer describes intersectional feminism as bearing great resemblance to social justice as though somehow the former is not a quintessential component of the latter. Thirdly, Teal Deer thinks intersectional feminism is a small branch of feminism, despite the fact that intersectionality is one of the underpinning ideas within third wave feminism, the wave in which we have been swimming since the early 90s, and that all the feminists he spends his time disagreeing with are intersectionalists. Additionally, intersectionality theory, as already mentioned, has been a formal part of academic feminist studies since the 1980s. So Teal Deer's belief that we are talking about a small branch of feminism indicates sloppy research. Fourthly, Teal Deer describes intersectional feminism as trying to stick their fingers into everyone else's pie. Much like the earlier clip, this portrays a bizarre blindness to the fact that categories such as race, sexuality, gender, and so on all unavoidably intersect with one another. By accusing intersectional feminists of trying to stick their fingers in other groups' pies, Teal Deer is essentially arguing that categories such as race, sexuality, gender, etc. don't already intersect, and that intersectionalists are forcing them to. 
For this to make any sense, black people, trans people, homosexual people, and women would all have to be mutually exclusive categories, which they pretty obviously aren't. If we must use this bizarre fingers in pies analogy, then a trans woman, by virtue of being a trans woman, already has a finger in both the women's issues pie and the LGBTQ issues pie. A gay black man, such as the aforementioned Tim, already has a finger in both the black issues pie and the LGBTQ issues pie. A disabled lesbian woman already has a finger in both the disability pie and the women's issues pie and the LGBTQ pie. We could, of course, go on all day with this. But the point is, it is utterly absurd to accuse any of said people of sticking their fingers in other people's pie when it's abundantly clear they have equal claim to more than one pie. Disclaimer, I agree the fingers in pies analogy is awful, but it is what I was given to work with here. What we have here is an unashamed turf, that is, trans-exclusionary radical feminist. Like most, if not all, turfs, Ex-menstrual fails to more aptly, or more aptly refuses to acknowledge that two disenfranchising categorizations, being a woman and being transgender, can and do intersect in such a way as to disenfranchise certain individuals, trans women, to a greater degree than individuals who fall into only one of these categories, cis women. It should also be noted that post-op trans women do have vaginas. I get the impression that people such as TERFs feel that if they acknowledge that they have cis privilege, somehow that will draw attention away from their disenfranchisement as women. In reality, all intersectional feminism asks of them is that they acknowledge their cis privilege for the same reason men should acknowledge their male privilege. In a certain sense, I find people like X menstrual to be more concerning than people like Teal Deer. Teal Deer is a conservative libertarian, and despite his claims of not being an MRA, he is an obvious sympathiser with misogynistic websites such as A Voice for Men, neither of which have anything to do with progressive politics. Ex Menstrual, however, identifies as a feminist, a label which has a lot to do with progressive politics, yet she perpetuates trans exclusion within feminism, a very non-progressive standpoint. This encroaching of non-progressive ideas into progressive movements is more than a little insidious. To quote Audrey Lord, there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. To quote Professor Crenshaw, if we aren't intersectional, some of us, the most vulnerable, are going to fall through the cracks. As I said earlier, I'm by no means an expert in this subject, so if anyone watching has academic qualifications relating to intersectionality and would like to correct me on anything or perhaps even make a better video on the subject, I encourage you to do so. Thanks for watching. Addendum. In the interests of being more intersectional, I'd like to encourage YouTubers who support social justice to start either closed captioning their videos or putting the text from their transcript on screen for the benefit of the hard of hearing. <laughs>